What do you see as the biggest issues in this election? Well, from my point of view, I see four issues as being the biggest issues in this election. Cost of living, climate, war and refugees. And on cost of living, what we've seen over the last 12 months is basic consumer items like food have increased by over 5% in the last 12 months. That is the biggest increase in, in prices in the last 20 years since the goods and services tax was passed in 1998. Um, so this ha is having a disastrous effect on people. It means that people can't afford housing, people can't afford food, they can't afford to pay their electricity and water bills. And it also means that it's made worse by the fact that the government has artificially kept incomes down. They've introduced so many anti-union laws to make it very hard for workers to win wage increases. And a lot of workers um, are now in non-union places or places without an enterprise bargaining agreement, without a framework to be able to fight for higher wages. And people who are on Centrelink benefits haven't had a proper increase to those benefits in 25 years. Um, this is just absolutely disgraceful. It means that there's virtually no place where people who are on Centrelink benefits can afford to live in Australia. Um, I think one of the Anglicare surveys several years ago showed something like only five places across Australia which takes in you know, very isolated regional areas as well as capital cities were available to be able to for rent for people who are on Centrelink benefits were affordable for those people. And so this is an absolute disgrace. And so the cost of living does have to be addressed. Then there's the issue of climate change, one of the great unmentioned things during the election campaign. And the climate issue is disastrous. So the coalition's proposal to, for net zero emissions by 2050 is really just kicking the can down the road let's just dawdle along and you know who cares what the future is that's really what their viewpoint is so i think i don't have any confidence they even intend to reach this target of 2050 and of course that was exposed by one of the national party mps saying that this was not a real promise by the coalition government um and i suspect that is the case they did the bare minimum that they could um to, in order to announce to the world at uh, the big climate conference last year, um, they did the bare minimum so they had something that they could announce amongst all of the other governments last year. And of course the coalition wants to keep on exporting coal for as long as they possibly can. They want to expand gas production. But then on the other side, the ALP wants to, wants to expand gas production as well. Um, the last time I looked, gas was a fossil fuel and it's one of the fuels that's causing climate change. So there is a massive problem at the heart of politics in this country on the issue of climate change. Then we get to the question of war, where for several weeks now, the coalition government has tried to scare the pants off Australians to make Australians feel that they're about to be invaded any minute and need to go in a massive rearmament exercise um, with a big increase in the size of the military, uh, purchasing of all of these extra uh, military weapons, Australia to become a massive uh, weapons manufacturer. And then the latest is that Peter Dutton, the Minister for Defence, or I would call him the Minister for War, uh, is almost trying to lure us into a third world war by um, sort of indicating that this is a belligerent sort of stance that Australia needs to adopt, which is preparing for war and not, um, not the other side of it, which is trying to de-escalate conflicts so that they don't end up in war. War is disastrous for working class people and we can see this in Ukraine where it's causing disaster for Ukrainian people, but it's also causing disaster for Russians. It's also causing disaster 
for the six or seven countries that have been pushed into famine as a direct result of the war in Ukraine. Um, that includes Yemen. And the ALP, unfortunately, is going along with uh, a lot of this. Um, but we need to de-escalate. We don't need war. And, you know, we've seen similar consequences with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Yemen to what we're seeing in, in Ukraine. Then there's the issue of refugees, where neither major party plans to do anything significant for refugees. And certainly the uh, Medivac refugees, any refugee who arrived in Australia by boat after 2013, has no hope regardless of which party wins government. Um, Both the major parties are committed to making sure that no asylum seeker who sought refuge in Australia by boat after 2013 will ever be resettled in Australia, no matter whether they are recognised as genuine refugees or not. This is a disgraceful state of affairs. These people left their families behind. In a lot of cases, I haven't seen their families in eight, nine, ten years. And they're in Australia in a limbo, waiting for some other country to resettle them. Canada, US, New Zealand. In my mind, this is no puts Australia in the same uh, category as people smugglers or human traffickers are trafficking refugees around the world because Australia refuses to resettle them. There's only one element where the Labor Party intends to do anything significant, and that is abolish temporary protection visas, which would help tens of thousands of refugees. But we need permanent protection and resettlement for every single refugee, regardless of whether they arrived here by boat or not, regardless of what year they arrived here. So those are the key issues I see coming into this election. ALP has opted for a very narrow target election campaign strategy. What are the consequences of this? The ALP's decision to dump anything progressive it took to the previous election and go to this election with a Me Too kind of approach of saying, oh, the coalition has said this and we will do the same thing or something just slightly better than what the coalition's promising. I think this is outrageous because what it means is it doesn't challenge the right-wing nature of the government's proposals. For instance, the Australian government does not intend to increase Centrelink benefits in up to the level of the poverty line, which would be something like $200 odd between $180 to $200. Um, the ALP has also said that they won't review, won't even review, let alone increase the job seeker rate. This is absolutely dis- disgusting. They don't. That means the ALP is not challenging the Morrison government's uh, frequently repeated statement that anyone who's on job seeker, it's their own fault, they refuse to get up and get a job, blah, 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 blah. Even now, with the unemployment rate dropping, there's still a layer of people who are applying for jobs and not getting those jobs, either because they don't have the training and experience, maybe they don't have the polish that some other candidates have who've recently been in the workforce, but there are a whole lot of people who are discriminated against in terms of jobs, despite the fact that unemployment has decreased. Um, The ALP is also not challenging the government on a whole series of other issues. They're not challenging the government on the treatment of refugees by adopting a Me Too approach. They're not challenging the government in the question of war by just putting forward a sort of Me Too approach of saying, well, we think national security should be should get increased funding and they're now proposing um, sort of military defence aid uh, from a Labor government if it gets elected and also that um, and also that they'll uh, fund the, de- the defence forces of Pacific nations. And so the ALP's stepped straight into providing military aid, 
not ordinary aid for ordinary people. And this is, it's blurring things for the Australian people, but also it's mis-educating Australians because they're not challenging the incredibly right-wing notions behind all of this. And then the government, to much fanfare, adopted a position of net zero emissions by 2050. Now, School Strike for Climate described that as delay tactics, trying to delay action as long as possible so that delay is a new denialism. Um, they're equating Morrison's plan to delay net zero emissions till 2050, the equivalent of cl climate deniers. And I think that's right, because who can tell what will happen in 2050? And the world will probably be totally cooked by the time we get to 2050. So we need action now. And unfortunately, the Labor Party, while it is better than the Coalition on Climate Change, it's not advocating to do anything that's sufficiently radical to cause a shift away from fossil fuel and towards um, climate action. So this is really um, a really rotten strategy by the Labor Party. Even if it helps them get into office, um, and we don't know if they'll get elected or Morrison will get re-elected, but even if this small target strategy helps them get into office, that's still a really problematic way for a party to get elected, that they're elected on the base of a Me Too strategy with the coalition government. and not challenging any of those views from the left point of view. What do you think about the trade union's performance in this election campaign? Well, I would say the trade unions have been pretty invisible in this election campaign. I don't think that's entirely their fault. It's partly also because the media, since the announcement of the election date, has suddenly narrowed the focus on to who is making the most gaffes? Is it Albanese or is it Morrison? And by that strategy, the media is actually helping the government and they're helping people forget the crimes of the Morrison government over the last three years. So I think this, um, this has been, you know, really disastrous. And so I think in that, um, in that, way in which the media is covering things. They're not prepared to cover what the union movement is saying. But still, the union movement response itself has been inadequate as well. Um, there's certainly been no mobilisations on the streets. There haven't been, as far as I can tell, much in the way of public announcements from the ACTU or, other, or individual unions calling for a different direction for Australia, for workers. Um, so I think you know, their, their presence has been not really felt by most people. And I think, I think it is an advance that they're now calling for a vote for Labor and the Greens, Labor or the Greens, because they're recognising finally that the Greens are to the left of Labor. But we really need the unions to come even further left to support the socialist candidates and socialist campaigns and to um, and to put forward a clear alternative to what the Liberal Party is putting forward. Do you think the closing of in of the major parties around a neoliberal pro-war conservative agenda risks the rise of the far right, as we have seen in France and other European countries? Well, I think the closing of the Liberal and Labor parties in on clear neoliberal policies and pro-war policies does make it a better environment for Nazis and neo-Nazis to recruit, for the far right to recruit. Because basically the two major parties, especially the coalition, are doing their best to try and make Australians frightened, make Australians feel as if we need to waste all of this money on war spending, when there's no threat to Australia, there's definitely no credible threat to Australia. So we, this, um, what this does is it disarms Australian work, working class people because the, you know, the Labor Party has a much bigger voice in the media than 
ordinary than any ordinary person from the left or otherwise and so while there are voices from the left and there are some NGOs that are sort of supportive of the left while they're um, all arguing quite cogently against the coalition's pro-war policies they're not they're not getting um, they're not getting covered in the media at all and I think that then does lead to a right-wing um, trajectory in the Australian population or was, or was likely to lead to a right-wing trajectory on questions of war. So I think the narrowing of the um, major parties onto a neoliberal agenda and uh, a pro-war positioning is really dangerous because it means that the Labor Party is not challenging the pro-war rhetoric that's coming out of Peter Dutton's mouth. Now, Peter Dutton is the Minister for Defence, but I would say he's actually the Minister for uh, Initiating War. Um, he's certainly adopting a very strong pro-war stance, trying to terrify Australians into uh, accepting that there's some sort of military threat to Australians, which necessitates massive increase in the defence force, a massive increase in uh, military spending, and a need to ally us, Australia with the United States over um, the US interests in Ukraine and um, in other parts of the world as well. And this um, ALP's Me Too stance on this means that they're not challenging any of that, which then creates a very fertile ground for the far right to grow, as we've seen happen in Europe. Many people looking for an alternative to the left of the major parties see the Greens and the new woman independents as viable alternatives. Why should they consider a vote for Socialist Alliance? Well, why the Greens might be um, more progressive than Labor Party and more progressive than uh, the Liberal Party, they are still not an adequate alternative to the major parties mainly because they're still fixated on market solutions. They're not anti-capitalists. They still think that you can achieve cl climate action through the market. And what we've seen over the last 30 years that I've been aware of climate change is that the market has failed. If the market was going to be successful in solving the issue of climate change and shifting the economy to 100% renewable energy, this would have happened years and years ago. It would have happened 10 to 20 years ago, but that hasn't happened. So I think the people do need to consider voting for an alternative, voting one for Socialist Alliance, and then voting for the Greens ahead of Labor, because their pro, the Greens' pro-market approach is not enough on climate change, on, war, on, on solving the water situation, on recycling, or any number of different environmental issues. And I'd say the second reason why it's important to support the socialists is because every major social and political reform in Australia has been won not as a result of politicians initiating change, but as a result of movements of people, grassroots movements, um, raising issues, campaigning on issues, and then convincing enough parliamentary players to change policy and change legislation on those particular issues. So that that's where the socialist movement would um, would pledge to support those campaigns if we're elected. And from my experience on the Moreland Council, um, I've been able to win a number of things as a single vote on council. Um, that doesn't mean I've won everything, but I've won a number of things. And the way I've done that is through working with the community to build community campaigns in areas where the council has done something where it's trying to close something such as the Faulkner Outdoor Pool, for example, last year. Um, probably, if it wasn't for the community campaign, it would have only been me against the closure of the outdoor pool. But because we had a community campaign, we managed to put enough pressure on the council 
for that to be a unanimous decision on council. So we need that interaction of grassroots movements with socialists elected to parliament, whether it be at federal, state or council level.